Dear Gesein, dear Gustav, thank you for this excellent opportunity. Thank you for the invitation. To all of you, thank you for being here. Thank you for the warm welcome. Above all, thank you for this opportunity to build bridges, to pave common ground, to bring harmony in the face of several attempts to sow the seeds of discord between peoples whose historic duty is to come closer together. Since the end of the war, the Greeks and the Germans, together with the rest of the Europeans, have been uniting. We have been uniting despite different languages, diverse cultures, distinctive temperaments. In the process of coming together, we were discovering with great joy that there are fewer differences between our nations than the difference observed within our nations. Then came the global financial disaster of 2008. And a year or two later, European peoples, who were, as I said, hitherto uniting so splendidly, ended up increasingly divided by a common currency. A paradox that would have been delightful if it were not so fraught with danger. Danger for our peoples. Danger for our future. Danger for the idea of a shared European prosperity. History does seem to have a flair for farce, judging by the way it sometimes repeats itself. The Cold War did not begin here in Berlin. It began in the streets of Athens in December 1944. The Euro crisis also started life in Athens in 2010, triggered off by Greece's debt problems. Greece was by a twist of fate the birthplace of both the Cold War and the Euro crisis. But the causes, of course, for both, run much wider than the streets of Athens, and they spanned the whole of our continent. Now, what were the causes of the Euro crisis? News media and politicians, I may add, love simple stories. Like Hollywood, they adore morality tales featuring villains and victims. Aesop's fable of the ant of the grasshopper proved an instant hit. From 2010 onwards, the story goes something like this. The Greeks, Greek grasshoppers did not do their homework, and their debt-fueled summer day ended abruptly. Then, the ants were called upon to bail them out. And now the German people are being told the Greek grasshoppers do not pay, want to pay back the debt. They want another bout of loose living, more fun in the sun, and another bailout so that they can finance it. It is a powerful story, I understand that. A story underpinning a tough stance that many advocate against the Greeks, against our government. The problem is that it is a misleading story, ladies and gentlemen. A story that casts a long shadow on the truth. An allegory that is turning one proud nation against another, with losers everywhere, except perhaps the enemies of Europe and of democracy, who are having a field day. Now, let me begin with a truism. One person's debt is another person's asset. Similarly, one nation's deficit is another nation's surplus. When one nation's origin is more industrialized than another, when it produces most of the high-value-added tradable goods, while the other nation concentrates on low-yield, low-value-added non-tradables, we have an asymmetry, a self-perpetuating asymmetry. Think not just Greece in relation to Germany. Think also East Germany in relation to West Germany. 
Missouri in relation to neighboring Texas, North England in relation to the greater London economy. All cases of trade imbalances with impressive staying power. Now, if you have a freely moving exchange rate between the surplus and the deficit regions or nations, like, for instance, Japan and Brazil have, well, this freely moving exchange rate helps keep the imbalances in check at the expense of volatility. But when we fix the exchange rate to give more certainty to traders, to business, or even more powerfully, when we adopt a common currency, something else happens. Banks begin to magnify the surpluses and the deficits. They inflate those imbalances and make them more dangerous, automatically, without asking voters, or the Bundestag, or the Greek parliament, without even the government of the land taking notice. It is what I refer to as toxic debt and surplus recycling by the banking system. It is very easy to see how this happens. During the years, the good years, in inverted commas, of the 2000s, when the Eurozone was first created, a German trade surplus over Greece generated, by definition, a transfer of euros from Greece to Germany. This is precisely what was happening during those good times, before the crisis. Euros earned by German companies in Greece, and elsewhere in the periphery, of course, amassed in the banks here, in Frankfurt, to be more precise. This money increased Germany's money supply, lowering the price of money in Germany. And what is the price of money? It's the interest rate. This is why interest rates in Germany were so low relative to other Eurozone member states. Now, suddenly, the banks of the surplus countries, the northern banks, the banks of Frankfurt, for instance, or, or Paris, for that matter, had a reason to lend their reserves back to the Greeks, to the Irish, to the Spanish, to nations where the interest rate was considerably higher, as capital is always scarcer in monetary unions' deficit regions. So it was that a tsunami of debt flowed from Frankfurt, from the Netherlands, from Paris, to Athens, to Dublin, to Madrid, unconcerned by the prospect of a drachma or a lira devaluation or a peseta devaluation, as we all share the euro, and lured by the fantasy of riskless risk, that fantasy that was born in Wall Street and the city of London but very quickly made its way onto the European continent. Now, put differently, debt flows to places like Greece were the other side of the coin of Germany's trade surpluses. Greece's and Ireland's debt to German private banks maintained German exports to Greece and to Ireland. This is similar to buying a car from a dealer who also provides you with the loan so that you can afford to buy the car. Vendor finance is the term we use. Now, can you begin to see the problem? To maintain one nation's surpluses within a monetary union, the banking system must pile up increasing debts upon the deficit, deficit nations. It can't happen otherwise. But ladies and gentlemen, for every irresponsible borrower, and by golly, Greece was an irresponsible borrower, borrower there corresponds an irresponsible lender. This is why there is no profit to be had today from thinking about debt in moralistic terms. We, together, we Europeans, built an asymmetrical monetary union with rules that guaranteed the generation of unsustainable debt. This is how we constructed it. We're all responsible for it, jointly, collectively, as Europeans, and we're all collectively responsible for fixing it, as Europeans, without pointing fingers at one another, without recriminations. Now, before 2009, I remember that with horror. The Greek media were ever so proud that we Greeks, the Greek economy was growing faster than Germany. We were proud of that. 
idiots that we were. Of course, we were wrong. It was pyramidic, Ponzi growth, fueled by unsustainable death, debt. So when our bubbles burst in 2009, 2010, the German press accused the periphery of, of profligacy and of being bad European citizens who got what they deserved. It was the turn of the German press to get it wrong. The peripheries, peripheries exorbitant debts were essential for the flow of surpluses from the periphery to the core of our monetary union. In summary, our Eurozone surplus recycling was at the heart of the problem. In 2009, 2010, when the international financial crisis hit and caused a credit crunch which led to the bursting of the bubbles in the periphery, countries like Greece and Ireland took a big hit on behalf of a Eurozone that was not designed well. We, in Greece in particular, speaking as a Greek, we took a hit so that the banks would be saved. The banks that did all the recycling so badly beforehand. To save a Eurozone economically incapable of absorbing the shock waves of the great financial crisis of 2008, that the Eurozone design had created, and which Europe was politically unwilling to come to terms with and to try to redesign it in good time. Now, for five years now, Europe and three different Greek governments have been misleading the people of Greece and the people of Germany. We have been pretending, speaking now as governments, that we solve the crisis by extending it into the future, pretending that the nations, the Greek nation's bankruptcy could have been dealt with by ever-increasing loans on condition of further income-sapping austerity, which undercut the nation's capacity to repay. Meanwhile, in my country, a Great Depression took hold. The political center imploded, children faint at school from malnutrition, and Nazis, yes, Nazis, are coming out of the woodwork in the streets of our cities. As I already said, it is truly pointless to indulge in the blame game. Whose fault was the crisis? We are all at fault. We created a Eurozone with a surplus recycling mechanism with which mathematical precision led to a crisis with victims everywhere. The longer we take to realize this, and the more we point fingers at one another, the more we allow proud nations to turn against one another, the greater our collective fault. Earlier, I referred to the Aesop fable, the, ant, uh, the grasshopper, that has done, in my opinion, so much damage to our people's understanding of their relation with one another and to their appreciation of each other. Allow me to retell the Aesop tale slightly differently, just for a minute. Now, to begin with, I hope you agree with the idea. Not with the idea. I hope you agree that the idea that all the ants live in the north and all the grasshoppers have congregated in the south is comical. There are ants and there are grasshoppers everywhere. They are deserving and there are undeserving people in Greece, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Malta, in Britain, everywhere. Now, what happened in Europe after we established the euro? During the good times, whether the ants worked hard everywhere, in Germany and in Greece. And the ants were finding it very hard, even during the good times, in Germany and in Greece, to make ants meet. In contrast, the grasshoppers, both in Greece and in Germany, were having a finance-fueled party. The flow of private money from the surplus to the deficit countries allowed the grasshoppers of the north and the grasshoppers of the south to create huge paper wealth for themselves at the expense of the ants of the north and the ants of the south. And then when the crisis hit, it was the ants of the north and the ants of the south that were called upon to bail out the grasshoppers 
both of the North and of the South. <laughs> These bailouts cost the ants very dearly in this country, as well as in my country, in Slovakia, in Italy, in Portugal, everywhere. Especially the Greek ants, which inherited a Great Depression that makes Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath come vividly alive again. They lost their jobs, their houses, their pensions, while at the very same time, the German ants felt cheated. Hearing all about all these billions that your government was sending to the Greeks, while the German ants saw their living standards refuse to rise despite their hard work, their productive efforts, the profitability of the firms in which they worked here in Stuttgart, in Aachen, everywhere. As for the Greek grasshoppers, some of them also suffered, but I can assure you that most of them, the big fat ones in Greece, had nothing to worry about. They took their ill-gotten monies to Geneva, to London, to Frankfurt, and they laughed all the way to the bank. This is what, what was so wrong with the bailouts. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a mistake to say that Germany did not pay enough money to Greece. Germany paid far too much, but for the wrong reasons. Money... <laughs> money that did not help the Greeks. It was never a bailout for Greece. 91% of the money that Europe and the IMF lent to Greece went to the banks. Greek banks, German banks, French banks. It was money that was taken from the taxpayers of every country, including Greece, and thrown into a black hole of unsustainable debts while people suffered everywhere throughout Europe. We went from the 2000s, when we had debt-fueled growth, full circle to debt-fueled austerity. It is this vicious cycle that our government was elected a few months ago to put an end to. The moment we were elected, we went to the institutions, to our partners, and we said to them, you may think what you like of us, we have a name that jars badly amongst conservative and even social democratic parties everywhere. We are the radical left party. We don't expect you to like that. But at least we are bringing to you an important asset. We are not corrupt. We have not received a single euro from the corrupt powers that be in Greece to be elected. We run a shoestring campaign. We have no obligations to them. Use us. Work with us in order to end corruption in Greece. The first Eurogroup that I attended, I put forward a proposal to my fellow finance ministers, and it was this. The negotiations between our side and your side is going to be protracted, because we are challenging the very logic of the five years of MOU programs for Greece. But you and I, we agree on a number of things. We agree on tax evasion. We agree on corruption. We agree that the pension system needs to be reformed. We, need that, we agree that we have oligarchy in Greece. We agree that we have oligopolistic practices that need to be put to an end. We agree that the bureaucracy needs to be revamped. Why don't we agree, on the basis of that agreement, on three or four pieces of legislation that we can push through Greek Parliament? We have the authority to do that. The Greek people have vested it to us. Why don't we agree to do this? And meanwhile, we're continuing the negotiation. I was told in no uncertain terms by the institutions and by the Eurogroup, forget it. We are not going to have a piecemeal approach. There has to be a full and comprehensive review. Everything has to be accept, accepted, decided jointly with the institutions. And then, and only then, will you put everything through your parliament. And if you do it on your own, this will be considered a unilateral action, which is equivalent to casus belli. So we went along. We wanted to play along. We wanted to be cooperative. So we entered into the full comprehensive review. But there were three impediments 
to the conclusion of these negotiations, which are still impeding their conclusion. The first one is economically unsustainable numbers. If you look at the previous programs and if you look at the proposals of the institutions now, on the fiscal side of the Greek equation, there are three important numbers. One is the projected growth rate, which is necessary to grow the economy in order to be able to repay our, our debts and to service our people. Growth rate, variable number one. Variable number two, the primary surplus. That is, what is left to the Greek state after it has paid for all its expenditures except for debt repayments. Thirdly, tax measures and benefit measures, pension measures, and all that. These three numbers, so growth rate, primary surplus, and fiscal numbers, fiscal measures, think of them as three variables in a system of three equations which you are trying to solve. The idea that Greece, after having received the largest loans in human history in order to mask, to disguise the unsustainability of the previous loans on condition of austerity that it reduced our income by a quarter, that logic now leads us to a situation where the institutions are insisting that in order to pretend further that our debts are sustainable, we have, to have, we have to promise primary surpluses that are so large that the growth rate they're assuming to be necessary cannot be produced because those primary surpluses are like me as a finance minister reaching into the guts, into the heart, into the substance of the private sector and extracting so much out of it that the private sector cannot produce the growth, which is then essential for this equation or system of equations to be solved. One reason why we haven't reached an agreement is this. Privately, we are being told that there is a logic to what we're saying. Politically, it's very hard for the institutions to come out and admit it. Then, secondly, there are ideological fixations. Take, for instance, the case of labor markets. In Greece, for two years now, we have no protection of labor, no collective bargaining. It was all taken away. The result, ladies and gentlemen, is that more than one-third of paid labor is undeclared labor. The labor market in Greece is as unregulated as it can be. 500,000 Greeks haven't been paid for the last six months. They keep working, hoping that one day they will be paid. This is worse than slavery. Under slavery, at least workers, or slaves, were guaranteed shelter and food. In Greece, this is a luxury for many workers. So what have we suggested to the institutions? We don't want to go back to the old-fashioned labor laws of the 1980s and 90s. What we recommended was that we go to the International Labor Organization and we design modern labor market rules, modern collective bargaining rules or legislation with them. Maybe we can borrow from the German model or the French model. We are not asking for anything that the rest of Europe doesn't have. But no, this was described recently, very recently, as backtracking by the Greek government, wanting to reintroduce sensible ways of regulating labor markets so that we don't have the broken down labor markets that we have. Let me give you another example, pensions. The pension system in Greece is not sustainable, but how could it be? When you've got more than one-third of paid labor undeclared, and these workers are not contributing to pension funds, when you have this complete implosion of the labor market with unemployment sky high, when you have the PSI um, debt write-down of 2012 that took billions of euros out of the pension funds as part of the write-down of the bonds that they were obliged by law to hold, of course this pension system is not sustainable. We want to reform it. What is the reform proposal that's coming from the institutions that we should cut pensions? They've already been cut by 40%. 40%. Is cutting further a reform? I don't think it's a reform. I mean, any butcher can take a cleaver and start chopping things down. We need surgery. 
We need to find ways of eliminating early retirements, of merging pension funds, of reducing their operating costs, of moving from an unsustainable to a sustainable system rationally and gradually. Let me give you one more example, VAT. We're being told that the reform that we should effect as of today is to push electricity from 13% VAT to 23%. 10% in a country which is afflicted by energy poverty. We're being told that the 6% VAT rate for drugs should go up to 12%. Imagine if I were to go to my parliament and recommend that the way out of this crisis is by having low pension pensioners who are receiving something like 300, 350 euros a month. That the institutions are recommending that we lob 120 of that 350, reducing by 120 euros a 350 euro pension, while at the same time pushing the drugs that these pensioners are paying for from 6% to 12%. Do you think that my country is going to become reformable? Do you think that I can infuse the Greek people to do that which they have not done in the last five years, and that, that is to embrace our reform agenda? I don't think so. So what we want, Gesin, to use the term that you disparaged quite rightly, please allow us to do our homework. Please allow us to reform. If you continue to squeeze our population into misery, we will not be reformable ever. This government has the capacity to convince the people, a capacity that the previous governments lacked, that we need to reform deeply, because we do. We're full of malignancies in the Greek state. We can carry the people, but not if we are asked to exact even further austerity upon them. Read our draft staff level agreement, which, in which we tried to codify the points of agreement between the institutions and us as of last week. And read the measures that we are proposing where agreement has not been reached. What you will find in that SLA, which is available because it has been leaked, we didn't leak it, you will find a catalog of reasonableness. Now, read the SLA that was presented to us by Mr. Juncker on behalf of the institutions. I don't blame Mr. Juncker. I don't believe that it was his script. Compare and contrast the two. I shall leave this to you. What we need is an agreement quickly. We need to avert an accident that won't be an accident. History is not going to take it down as an accident. History will take it down as a failure of the political class of the European Union, of me, of Dr. Schäuble, of Mrs. Merkel, of Alexis Tsipras, of Mr. Juncker, of the whole political class. We have a historic duty not to allow this to happen. And what do we need to do? <laughs> what do we need to do to have an agreement? The press impresses people with tales of complexity. It's very complex. It's not. We can do it in one night. Our leaders can lock themselves, as they usually do in Europe, <laughs> into a room for a, at 8 o'clock in the evening and emerge at 4 in the morning with an agreement. It will be hard, but they can do it. What would that agreement comprise? Let me tell you very quickly. There should be a list of very deep reforms for the Greek state. We need an independent tax authority that accepts no political interference from ministers like me, but also, it doesn't accept any interference from corporate interests. Corrupt corporate interests that want not to be taxed and influence the tax authority. Huh? Independent tax authority. Bring us people from Germany to staff it, even to head it. Help us in that way. Secondly, this is just one example. Reforming the pension system, reforming ta the tax system, increasing the collectability of tax. We don't need higher tax rates in Greece. We need more taxes to be collected, and actually we need lower tax rates. This sounds a bit neoliberal, but it's true. If you want to... <laughs>
If you want to increase, increase collectability, don't increase the tax rate because people then deal under the table, especially in a country like Greece, which is broken down. Sometimes they have to deal under the table to survive. Poverty has reared its ugly head some time ago in Greece. So we need these reforms. I'm not going to bore you now with it. Read our SLA. We can add more reforms. We're flexible. We're willing to listen. Give us more, even painful ones. So that's one segment, one part of the three-part agreement that our leaders should produce overnight. The second part concerns debt. The whole point of our government regarding debt is to maximize the amount of money we return to you. We need to find a way of making our debt more sustainable, to link it to our growth, so that we can return in net present value terms, as financiers like to say, as much back to the Europeans and the institutions that lent us money. We can do this very easily. Let me give you an example. At the moment, we have a debt to the ECB, to the European Central Bank, of 27 billion. It's a lump of bonds that was purchased by Mr. Trichet in 2010-2011. It's sitting there on the books of the ECB. Nobody likes it. The ECB doesn't like it, we don't like it, nobody likes it. Now, this is short-term debt, because it's old debt, it's maturing very shortly. So next month, in the next couple of months, as finance minister, I'll have to find almost 7 billion. I have to borrow from you, 7 billion, to give to the central bank. Doesn't sound very clever. What if we were to have an agreement that the set of reforms that our leaders would agree to will be the common conditionality for ending the previous program and for a new loan from the ESM, which will not come to us. I don't want a penny of it for the Greek state. We use it to give it to the ECB, to get those bonds, and retire them. And then we acquire the liability to the ESM, which will be long-term, and primarily by shifting that bundle of bonds from the ECB onto the ESM, suddenly we can participate in quantitative easing, and Greece can re-enter the markets, so we don't have to borrow from you, we can borrow from the money markets and manage to get onto a trajectory that will allow us to pay all our debts to you and to the ESM. This is just an example of the kind of agreement that our leaders could come up with within one evening, one long night. Then there should be a third component. Even if all our debt suddenly went away, through divine intervention, let's say. Given that we are committed never to run a deficit again in our government, we will do whatever it takes to borrow a term from Mario Draghi. We will introduce a debt break, a deficit break. We will legislate about that. We will not allow Greece to fall back into the um, primary deficits that were the cause of the problems to begin. But given that we are going to always have a primary surplus because we are determined, it's a question of dignity to do it. And given that our banking system is overladen with non-performing loans, so banks find it very hard to lend. And given that there is almost next to no investment, why? Because investors hear about Greece all the time as on the verge of collapse, of Grexit. Who wants to invest in a country where you read all these bad news every day? The announcement of the agreement amongst our leaders especially if it has the debt component to it and the promise of participating in the money markets again, deep reforms, and also an announcement of an investment package coming from, let's say, the European Investment Bank, dedicated to the private sector companies that are potentially profitable in Greece, and there are many of those. The announcement effect of that will be very simple. The crisis will be over. Grexit will be off the table. We will be able to repay our debts and you will never have to hear of the Greek crisis again. Now, it is quite clear that that might help Greece become a normal country again, but it wouldn't solve the problems that Europe has, the ones I described initially. The Eurozone, as I argued at the beginning of my talk, is not well constructed to take financial sector hits and to respond creatively and positively to recession. We've seen that everywhere. This is why we have quantitative easing at the moment. We need to do that which Helmut Schmidt, Helmut Kohl, Jacques Delors, 
Wolfgang Schäuble. Always understood. We need to supplement our monetary union with a political union. But what type of political union? Do we want an iron cage? Or a union capable of accommodating diversity, difference, and the mixed economy? One in which those critical of the current European policies, like our party, but committed to the European Union, cannot just be tolerated, but engaged with. Or one in which governments like ours are forced upon a path that leads to a crash, leading to the domination of the anti-Europeanists that reject Europe and all it stands for, ready to turn or return to national nationalistic tribalism that has for centuries caused Europe so much pain. Now, some, unfortunately, think that sacrificing Greece as a latter-day Iphigenia, if I am allowed to quote from Euripides' tragedy, will help the rest set sail toward political union under a regime of iron discipline forced by the fear that something like Brexit can befall the other nations. I fear that would be an attempt to stick to an unsustainable model by means of increasing degrees of authoritarianism and recessionary macroeconomics that will undermine Europe. Let's not forget that Agamemnon, in the end, due to his sacrifice of his daughter, met his comeuppance a few years later. I have another great tragedy to quote, better suited to what I think we should be doing. Antigone by Sophocles. She showed that we have a duty to challenge rules that go against basic principles of humanity and justice. To reassess the rules according to their efficacy and humanity and change them if we need to. Which do you think is best suited to the European project? The Agamemnon strategy or the Antigone strategy? I trust it is not the Agamemnon strategy. The major problem with this is that during a crisis, the political will to bring the asymmetrical monetary union's economies closer together, as we must do, is weakened. This crisis has not brought us closer together. It has created centrifugal forces that have set our peoples apart, which is tragic. Citizens turn their back to the monetary union understandably, and begin to crave more, or is it less, national sovereignty? Sometimes I'm confused. So the great big question becomes, is it possible to give the peoples of Europe, of this asymmetric monetary union, more sovereignty, more democracy, while at once introducing an effective set of rules that joins us together and maintains our common interests at the helm? I think it is, but of course it would be a completely new lecture to explain what that would entail. All I'm going to say now is that Greece is perhaps a good place to start. It is, after all, the place where both the Cold War and the Euro crisis began. On September 6th, 1946, the American Secretary of State, James Burns, traveled to Stuttgart, as you all know, I'm sure, to deliver his historic speech of hope. It marked America's change of heart in relation to Germany and gave this fallen nation a chance to reimagine a recovery, growth, and a return to normalcy. Let me remind you, if you need reminding. Until Burns' speech in 1946, until that speech of hope let rays of optimism pierce through occupied Germany, the Allies were united in their commitment to convert, and this is a quotation, Germany into a country primarily agricultural and pastoral in character. Burns' speech signaled to the German people a reversal of the punitive deindustrialization drive that, that by the end of the 1940s had seen to the destruction of 706 German industrial plants. Germany owes its post-war recovery and wealth to you, to its people, to your hard work, to your innovation, and to your commitment to a united democratic Europe. However, 
the German people would not have been in a position to stage a magnificent post-war renaissance without that speech of hope and that which it signified. Now, prior to Bern's speech, and for a while afterwards, America's allies, I won't mention them, you know them, were not keen to restore hope to Germany. But once Washington was, had decided to rehabilitate Germany, there was no turning back. Germany's renaissance was on the cards, facilitated by the Marshall Plan, by the United States-sponsored 1953 debt write-down, as well as by the infusion of migrant labor from Italy, from Yugoslavia, from Greece. I submit to you that Europe could not have united in peace and democracy without that sea change and the rehabilitation of Germany. Someone had to put aside moralistic objections and look dispassionately at a nation locked into a set of circumstances that would only produce discord and fragmentation across the continent. The United States, having emerged from the war as the only creditor nation, surplus nation, did precisely that. Seven decades later, now, another nation is locked into a frightful trap that is sending ripples across Europe and from which it cannot escape without a variant of Burns' speech of hope. It is my country, Greece. Moralistic objections abound and stand in the way of affording the Greek people a shot at achieving escape velocity, of doing their homework, as I put it before. Greater austerity is demanded for an economy than that is on its knees, due to the heaviest dose of austerity any nation has had to endure in peacetime. No offer of debt relief by the institutions, no plan for boosting investment, and certainly no speech of hope for our fallen people. The Greek government has tabled a set of proposals to the institutions, the SLA that I refer to, for deep reforms, for debt management, as well as an investment plan that will kickstart the economy. We are ready and willing to enter into a compact with Germany, with France, with Portugal, with Slovenia, with Europe, with the IMF, a compact that will eradicate the malignancies that were responsible for Greece being the first domino to fall in 2010. We are offering a debt break, deep reforms to weed out corruption, all those things that we all agree should happen in Greece. We are ready to play our part even in designing a proper sustainable recycling scheme for the Eurozone, to do our homework and stick to the rules, rules that we co-author with the rest of the Europeans, with the Germans. But to implement these reforms successfully, Greeks need a missing ingredient, hope. A speech of hope for Greece is precisely that which would take and make all the difference now. A speech of hope for Greece would benefit our creditors, as our renaissance will eliminate the probability of defaulting on their loans. Now, what should that speech for, of hope for Greece include? Well, allow me to say that just like Burns' speech was short on detail but long on symbolism, a speech of hope for Greece does not have to be technical. It could simply mark a sea change, a break with the past five years of adding new loans on already unsustainable debt on condition of more doses of punitive austerity that diminishes our incomes. Who should deliver the speech of hope? Well, I think it should be the German Chancellor. Where should it be delivered? Well, Athens, Thessaloniki, Hanya, Patra. Pick a city or a village. It doesn't matter. I think Ms. Chancellor Merkel could use the opportunity to hint at a new approach to European integration that starts in the country that has suffered the most, a victim both of its own malignancies and of Europe's faulty monetary design. On a practical note, let, let me, ladies and gentlemen, inform you that in our midst tonight, we have my great friend and colleague, James Kenneth Galbraith, whose father, John Kenneth Galbraith, wrote Burns' Speech of Hope. Maybe he could help anyone who wants in this great city 
to draft the speech of hope for Greece. Allow me to finish with two tales on a lighter note. One of the funniest stories I've heard as to why we created the Eurozone came from a friend whose name I will not mention. I added a little bit to it. It goes as follows. We created the Eurozone because the French feared the Germans, because the Italians wanted to be like the Germans, the Spanish wanted to be like the French, the Portuguese wanted to escape the Spanish, the Irish wanted to escape the British, the Greeks hated the Turks, uh, which is not true. Uh, the, the Belgians wanted to join up both Holland and France. And in the end, the Germans feared the Germans. <laughs> now, I don't believe in this. I'm only mentioning it because it's funny. But I, don't, I think it's wrong. And I think it's wrong for two reasons. Firstly, I don't believe that the Germans fear the Germans anymore. And I'm very glad that Germany has emerged as a very confident country, perfectly capable of facing up to the future as well as to the past. And secondly, I disagree because I don't believe that there is anything, that, that there is such a thing as the Germans or the Greeks. I know by looking at my fellow Greeks, I disagree with most of them. I dislike many of them. And I can assure you that many of them dislike me. So clearly, there is no such thing as the Greeks. Similarly, there is no such thing as the Germans. Maybe we should start thinking of ourselves as Europeans. Finally, allow me to end on a very personal note. One of the enduring memories of my childhood is the crackling sound of the wireless tuned into Deutsche Welle. Those were the bleak years of our 1967-1974 dictatorship. When Deutsche Welle was the Greeks' most precious ally against the crushing power of state oppression. Mom and dad would huddle together next to the wireless, sometimes covered in a blanket so that the neighbors wouldn't hear it because it was an offense to be listening to Deutsche Welle under the dictatorship. The fear of the secret police loomed large. Night after night, these forbidden radio programs brought into our home in Athens a breath of fresh air from a country, Germany, that was standing firm on the side of Greek democracy. I was too young to understand what the radio was telling my mesmerized parents, but my child's imagination, make no mistake, identified Germany as a source of hope. And there you have it. I end this speech, Gesin and Gustav, on this note as a tribute to my German friends who keep the memories of those Deutsche Welle crackling sounds alive, pertinent, and permanently inspiring. Thank you.